This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. You might wanna pour yourself a glass of something special to pair with this segment. We're kicking things off by talking about something I know pretty well, whiskey. Both bourbon, a type of whiskey, and Tennessee whiskey can trace their origins to the 18th and 19th centuries in the American South. One common story, albeit one that's probably more of a folk tale than actual history, ties bourbon's creation to the white Baptist preacher, Elijah Craig whose name still graces the bottles of a namesake bourbon brand to this day. But evidence shows us that it was actually black hands that took on a lot of the work that went into making these now classic spirits long before it was bottled. There's the obvious tremendous physical labor that went into it, right? Uh, you had to move large quantities of grain and other such non-glamorous jobs. And when we look at a lot of the old timey white gentlemen who were on the bottles, right? Like I don't imagine Elijah Craig was out here rolling around barrels himself, right? Cause in 1789, if you had enough money, why would you do that? That's Che Ramos, also known as the black bourbon guy. He runs a set of whiskey and bourbon tasting events that walk people through the very long and blacker than you think history of the spirits. Take none other than old number seven itself, Jack Daniels. Arguably, the most famous American whiskey brand owes its iconic taste to a black man, Nathan Nearest Green, also known as Uncle Nearest. He was the master distiller on the property of a, I'm sorry, a Lutheran pastor in Shelbyville, Tennessee. He was in charge of producing whiskey. A teenage Jack Daniel came to work on that farm at some point. The Lutheran pastor put the two of them together, asked uh, Nathaniel, or Uncle Nearest, if you will, to teach Jack Daniel how to make Tennessee whiskey, and uh, the legend was born. So why is it called Jack Daniels and not Uncle Nearest? Well, we're talking the 1880s here, right? So unfortunately it was not a realistic possibility for a black formerly enslaved man or not formerly enslaved man for that matter to raise enough capital to start a distillery himself. So there are people who believe that Jack Daniels uh, kind of did Uncle Nearest dirty. I don't think that that is the case at all. Um, it just the environment did not really work out well. Since 2016, Jack Daniels has acknowledged and celebrated Green's role in creating its signature product. Green is recognized on distillery tours and in the drink's history as its first master distiller. When we first told the story, we did not realize the significance and the importance to people. But it became very, very clear that this was an important story that people felt pride in. Here is a name that people didn't know that they could point to an African-American once enslaved individual who had accomplished something really remarkable in American industry uh, with a name that we all know today. Um, so it's important that people know Nearest name. The company also consciously chose not to make its own whiskey line honoring Green after hearing concerns that it would look like the company was cashing in on Green's name for its own gain. But his influence is recognized in other brands. In 2017, author Fawn Weaver launched her own whiskey brand after meeting relatives of Uncle Nearest who still worked for Jack Daniels. The name of the new brand? Uncle Nearest. And the master distiller? none other than Uncle Nearest's great-great-granddaughter, Victoria Edie Butler. In recent years, we've seen even more Black-owned brands join the scene, with experts estimating there are now a few dozen Black-owned distilleries. St. Liberty Whiskey has focused its whiskeys on women who distilled during Prohibition in the 1920s. One drink honors Bertie Brown, a Black woman in Montana who was one of the top moonshine makers in the country until she met an untimely death during the distillation process. Some of the vapor from her product caught fire uh, and blew her kitchen up, taking her out with it. Uh, so a really unfortunate end uh, to someone who sounded like she was a fantastic woman because, I mean, Prohibition running in the 1920s and 30s, it, it wasn't easy to do much as a black woman. That point resonated with St. Liberty investors, Dia Sims and Aaron Harris. They're already the CEO and chief brand officer respectively of another drink, Lobo 1707 Tequila. But the chance to join a project that honored those who came before them was too good to pass up. Their stories really shine because Look, of course they were, you know, living on the lamb and, and um, doing things that weren't within the law at that time. 
but they also were thriving entrepreneurs, right? Like driving their own economic empowerment at a time where things were even more constrained um, than they are today. The way they see it, that long history allows them to make more of it today. When you talk about um, black entrepreneurs, ownership and equity is so important to build wealth. So um, we've been around this industry working with distributors, working in the 360 ecosystem, and we haven't seen a lot of people like us. Folks, we've talked a lot about the past and present history of distilling the drinks, but now we're gonna explore a bit about black folks consuming and encouraging the appreciation of bourbon whiskey. For that, we traveled down to Atlanta to sit down for a drink with Samara B. Davis, founder and chief bourbon enthusiast at the Black Bourbon Society, and bellied up to a bar with her and master mixologist Tondi Walton to learn a little bit more. Samara B. Davis, mm -hmm. thank you so much for joining us. It's thank you for having me. It's wonderful being here at the Thompson Buckhead in Atlanta, Georgia. And we're joined by Tondi Walton, head of beverage yeah. at the Thompson Buckhead. Uh, my first question for you, uh, would you like a drink? Absolutely. What, what should we have? Let's consult with the head of beverage. We should, shall have a bourbon cocktail uh, with a little Zimbabwean South African flavor to it. Growing up in Zimbabwe, of course, we drank a lot of tea. So it's important for me to keep my culture within my creations. So it's Roboist syrup that I basically created out of Roboist tea that has um, hibiscus, um, elderberry, a um, few other loose leaves, and I add um, a little sugar, brown sugar, brown sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta have a brown sugar. Gotta it is Black sugar. History Month. So. Yes. 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 He's chose to meet me in Africa. It's meet called me. Meet Me in Africa. Today is Go Meet Me in Africa. Wonderful. Cheers. Cheers. To you. Cheers to you. Cheers. Oh, oh man, that is amazing. I want to ask this: How did that love? of bourbon blossom into the Black Bourbon Society. I started to play around with different bourbons. I wanted, I started to really pay attention to the, the smell, to the, the taste, the sense of it, all of that, the sensory experience of bourbon. Um, and coming from California, that was very easy for me to do because we used to do that in the wine industry. And so we used to drive up to Napa and had all the wines and that with that same experience with, with wine was completely applicable to bourbon. What is the narrative that has surrounded bourbon and bourbon drinkers? What does a bourbon drinker look like? Or what did people in marketing and advertising right. think that bourbon drinkers look like? Well, back then, and we have to, we have to put context into that, mm -hmm. that I started Black Bourbon Society almost seven years ago. So go back seven years, there is no African-American bourbon brand, very little African-American representation within the spirits industry itself. However, in the past seven years, we've seen a major shift in this industry. First of all, interest in bourbon has like skyrocketed in that in that time frame. Sales have sales skyrocketed have skyrocketed. As well. Innovation has skyrocketed. Brands coming to the market again. You've got this. You've got um, brand new brands like Uncle Nearest coming to the um, coming to the table. So now in this space, you see women, you know, entering in, in the space and African Americans. You know, from your perspective, um, you know, as as head of beverage here at Thompson Buckhead. You know, what is it that you've seen in the in the industry over the last 10 years, especially when it comes to um, black consumers and uh, brands reaching out to those black consumers? So what I've seen is the elevation of the palate. Mm -hmm. So we went from Jack, you know, to now we want everything neat or old fashioned. I've seen the influx of old fashions from high tier. So it's never the bottom of the barrel no more. They know what they would like to consume. I'm so proud of us as a people on the elevation of palettes. I used to say I changed palettes by the bar stool. Mm -hmm. I don't have to do that no more. I want to talk a little bit about barriers to entry. I think about um, economic hardships, getting right. loans, uh, you know, things of the like and how things are oftentimes worse for black Americans. So in thinking about, you know, barriers to entry, you know, how, how 
what, what are they when it comes to um, the, the spirits industry? And how, if at all, is that reflective of what it looks like for Americans in general? Well, there are a lot of barriers if you want to go from distilling to produ producing mm. a product, right? So if you want to build a distillery, you're, look, you're talking about $10 million off top. Right, and that's a, and it's even more than that. Really, it's more like fifty, especially when you start talking about securing the land, drawing up the plans, then building out a distillery, getting the still, which is custom made from Vendome. Like, and you start talking about all the equipment that needs to go into what a distillery needs in order to get started. That doesn't include the fact that once you distill the product, you then have to wait four to six years for it to mature before you put it in a bottle and sell it. So that path to um, getting into the whiskey industry is only really available for a very small few, but there, there's an easier way to do it. For African Americans in particular, and for, and for women even, mm -hmm. women have found a way to get into this a lot faster than I see black spirits professionals getting into. It's really the opportunities and the mentorship. Mm -hmm. There's barriers there as well, just because like we don't have the freedom, the flexibility to just focus on being an apprentice. So th those are the barriers that we're really seeing. Mm -hmm. um, but like there are a few folks that are pushing past those barriers, right? The social barriers, the economic barriers, just the accessibility barriers, and that are still dedicated to the spirit and, and getting it done. Samara B. Davis. Yeah. Thank you so much thank for you. your time. This is great. Tandy Walter. That's thank you pleasure. so much for your time. Thank you so much. One more. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Yay. Yay. Thank you. Cheers.